welcome to Hive. My office is upstairs, but this is our open area. And so when we started, how we... So here, uh, here's a story behind the circle line. I know the, the, uh, the blog post hit number one hacker news, so many of you might have uh, read, read the blog post. And so I will try to uh, I'll, I'll try to cover what we covered in the blog post as much as possible, um, but briefly, and then I'll add in a bit of nuggets, uh, other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'll first go through the background and how we how, how we got involved in the uh, circle line investigation. So the circle line interference problem started at the end of uh, August and suddenly it disappeared in September and resurfaced in November. So in November, on the 2nd of November, there was a major service disruption. On the, uh, yeah, on, the third, on the 3rd of November, the disruptions continued and the trains were manned manually. Uh, and the same thing happened on Friday and then on Saturday, uh, uh, my colleagues were, uh, my boss sent us an SMS in the morning and asked, uh, and, and said, we need to give a, pre need to give a presentation uh, this afternoon. Can somebody come to do some visualizations for us? And so that's how uh, I was roped in, and that's how my co colleague here, Clarence, was also roped in. And by the afternoon, we had more or less completed uh, our, uh, the, our findings. And uh, yeah, I'll save, it. I'll save the rest of the details for later. So, simply put, this was a data, this was a data we got. Uh, it tells us the day, the train that was uh, affected by a signal interference, the station at which interference occurred or if it was between stations, right, the two stations that it was between, and the time which it occurred. So, if you look, if you look at, uh, if you plot the, if you plot the uh, location of the trees along the, uh, on a map, on a, on a map of the, uh, the circle line, you will get something like this, and such a visualization will not really will not really go will not go very far. Uh, not as a histogram. So our team of, our, our team was familiar with the use of this. Uh, it's called the Mary chart, which uh, has has a time axis, has a time on one axis, and the location and the train station on the other axis, and. Therefore, our team naturally came, uh, naturally decided to use to plot the incidents on a like a scatter plot. So every incident uh, appears as a marker on this scatter plot. And once you have plotted enough markers, well, if you, you zoom out too much, you can't see anything. If you zoom in enough, you can see that the markers will form straight lines. If you cluster the straight lines. The, the markers together, you find that the straight lines match the speed of the train. And we not only notice it match the speed of the train, it also bounces off the terminal stations, harbour fronts and uh, Domigot or Marina Bay. Yes. So, so this led us to the conclusion that, uh, that it was a train causing the interference. And also because we use markers that uh, signify the direction of the, the, at which the train was going, we can tell it was the train in the opposite direction that was causing the interference. And then uh, that night, Clarence, uh, my dear friend Clarence here, because his laptop was the only one with Tableau installed on it, so he, uh, he had to stay up all night to watch a, to watch the video uh, the video playback of this schematic that shows where the trains were and uh, relative to the stations. And by 3 a.m. in the morning he found the train that was causing the steering problems. Uh, we verified it the next day 
with additional data and we showed that, uh, that problems only occurred when this train was in service. When we had even more data, we, we, we plotted the uh, incidents along with the position, the known position, time and position of the, of the faulty train. And then we could see that over 95 to 95% of incidents were caused by this faulty train. And the remaining 5%, well, there are, there are baseline, there's a baseline level of interference that, uh, that, the, that the, MRT, the SMRT is willing to accept, and well, who knows what they're caused by. And DSTAO and also independently came up you know, with, the, with similar conclusions. And yeah, so this is the this is a short overview of how how we uh, discover the trade. And I think the bigger story, the bigger story behind this is uh, about how. So well, if I had to summarize this incident in one in one word or one well term, it would be a scatter plot, right? Because the whole investigation involved only a scatter plot and seeing patterns in this scatter plot. But I think what I felt was most important in this uh, investigation was was the fact that if you didn't have a visualization that convinced uh, higher ups and the policy makers or the decision makers then it's very difficult to convince them that hmm, it is actually a, a, it's actually a train causing the problem. Uh, one of the reasons being that, well, the trains are on separate tracks, right? So how do they actually interfere with uh, each other? And uh, I think I am not at liberty to disclose too many details, but yeah. But so one that was one of the reasons why uh, SMRT was not too convinced that it was a, a train in the opposite direction. But the visualizations proved beyond doubt that, the, that it, it was a train. And so the investigation immediately narrowed uh, onto the train. Yeah, and if you have any questions, uh, I'll take them. Yeah. Uh, so, so um, ESTA, so it wasn't it wasn't just ESTA that had a hunch that uh, it was a train in the reverse direction. So in fact, so when we did this investigation, we had uh, we had a director from MCI involved in, in this investigation, and that director was with Clarence that night, and he also had a hunch that it was a train in the reverse direction. ESTA also had a hunch. So. The best that, well, the best. Well, DSTA came up with a diagram similar to this. And this diagram was also, plot, uh, was also pasted around the LTA op center. Right? But, um, but because they did not have a clear vis visualization that it was a train, so uh, they didn't have a clear visualization, so they, no one, they were not 100% convinced. So they were also looking into other possibilities. And yeah, so I uh, so uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yes. The uh, rope train, P forty six, right? Yes. Did it itself also break down? Yes, it did. So if you look at the histogram of breakdown trains. PD46 is actually a PSA. So, what caused PD46 to break down? Uh, that I would not be able to answer because none of us here are trained engineers and only SMRT can answer. But yes, it, uh, <laughs> uh, and DSA, DSA would be, would, might also be able to answer because they have, they have, they're, they're engineers. Uh, contributed actively to the like, investigation of hardware that we couldn't. And I think this was also one of the reasons why it was quite confounding because uh, they thought, they did suspect that PD46 was the rope train, but at the same time, it also broke down and you know, it's very hard to convince people that 
this is a rope train if it also broke down. So. Oh yeah, there's one question. It's a question. Uh, so you mentioned that you're not an uh, engineer field. So math. Uh, I studied computer science. Yeah. So uh, does it mean that uh, SMRT is so many engineers? So the SMRT has many has many engineers, and uh, the problem, I guess, was that they were they were they couldn't they they didn't have the benefit like us of not being experts in this area. So because they uh, they would from what I recall uh, from what they told us, they were looking into uh, the small details like uh, could it be this component that failed, could it be that component that failed, and they couldn't get an overall big picture. And, yeah. The, the more I see, the breakdown is actually, uh, it's across time and space. Right? Yes. So it should be something that is moving and dynamic, and not, not actually depend on one location, one piece of hardware, but something that's moving. So immediately, uh, oh, there's a spectrum or something like that. Okay. So but the other thing is, uh, the math that is done is exploratory. So it's not really tough, right? No, it is not very tough. So you have it's to mainly just visualization. It's not really. <laughs> I think my colleague Shang can also assist in investigation. Yeah. He's behind you. Would you like to? Hello, I'm Shang Xian. This one. Who had the luck of working contribution to this? I think I just want to help in answering this question. You're right, it's a little easy once you do the right visualizations. Um, and we, we saw many visualizations prior to this work to start on this project. Um, as Daniel has showed, you see, all these plots, you know, plotting them by day, by, by time, uh, by trade, all these were done even before we started. But they didn't manage to come to any conclusions from all these four because they didn't have the right, uh, the right visualization to make any points about it. So um, I just want to reiterate what that then said about uh, starting work on a project that is more exploratory or uh, maybe you're not so clear about what you're looking for. It's like you, you need to do as high a dimension plot as possible. So if you, if you look to the memory plot, this is a great plot when you don't know what you're looking for because it represents so much on just a on a, on a single bus. You see many trains moving on the tracks. You see the time dimension and you see spatial information and so This was something that, that the initial investigators did not uh, have the benefit of uh, trying out because you know, the electrical engineers and mechanical engineers they don't, normally, uh, they don't normally have so much experience with data visualization. So, um, it, to sum this all up, really, um, you starting with the right visualization, thinking about the highest possible way to, the highest dimension possible, possible way to, let's say, the data will really uh, be able to start and solve all these problems. Yes, and after, after you have this initial hunch of what the problem is, uh, subsequent map to try to prove that it's a single trade is actually quite trivial. Uh, hopefully, this is not single, and that's what I'm saying. Okay. So do you identify on PV46 some hardware that actually was well, the code? Oh. Do you identify some, some doing on hardware which you shouldn't be using? Or is this actually is this a PV56 actually that's on passengers? Uh, yeah. So yes, it was faulty hardware on PV46 and it was hardware to do with the trans uh, it was a signaling hardware. And well, if your signaling hardware has problems, it causes interference with other signaling hardware. And uh, yes, there were passengers on PV46. And but well, the passengers on PV46, in a in a sense, were the lucky ones. 
because the other train did not break down as much as the other trains in the opposite direction. Uh, I'm just curious, um, uh, I'm just curious, um, what, um, digitization tool did you use? Um, do you face things like scaling issues and stuff like that? Scaling issues? Uh, like, like, was data too big and stuff? Ah, okay. So, um, so, unlike some of the other projects that we do, uh, the data set for this was actually quite small, so, um, if you go to the blog post, you will see that the number of data, number of data points that we have is about 250. So it's well within the means of Excel and any other 1990s to... What were the software that you used for the like? The software you used was Tableau. Yeah. And, uh, I'm, okay, I'm not paid by Tableau, but I, I, I love the tool. So, uh, <laughs> so, I repeat, I'm not paid by Tableau. Um, so, I think Tableau is amazing. Like, if you look at this, uh, <laughs> you look at this, look at this chart. It's, uh, it's very information dense. You have the location, the time, the direction, and the possible faster than you want sense. Uh, yeah, uh, Tableau is Tableau was free. <laughs> it, it, and well, maybe if Tableau was what made made or break SMRT in the investigation, you never know. Ah, yes, so that was a problem. It was difficult to zoom in to a particular time. So we started having a talk like this, it's quite difficult to actually see the lines. But uh, well, we just applied the appropriate filters. It, uh, did you use the uh, realizing techniques for, to identify the location on different line, like North Shara or North Island, or is this only applicable on the circle line? This is only applicable to the circle line. So, uh, this, well, you see, to SMRT's credit, right, the circle line was the only one that where they really faced serious problems. Um, and it, that couldn't be, that couldn't be resolved by themselves, right? Uh, the incidents on North-South line, well, they, they resolved it, so... And uh, so this was the issue. The signal, the signal interference pro pro problem was the one that persisted over a month and they couldn't, couldn't uh, identify the problem, so they, that's why they got DSTA and they got uh, us to help. Hi, can you go to the first chart, the one that was saying of, uh, uh, I'm just here to explain. Uh, this one? Uh, do you want to say no, anybody for the channel? Yeah. yeah. I'm just curious, where is between 4 and 6? Uh, it is between, oh, sorry, between P45 and P47. Yeah, so this chart, the, the labels on this chart are solid, so, but there are too many labels, so we have to infer that between 45 and 47 is 46. So, so on this one, PV52 is actually uh, the one which has the most incident. Yes. So, yeah. So that that was a yeah, that, so that was a compounding factor, right? Like the the trains with the most incidents are, was was not really the one that had anything to do with the issue. Uh, Hello. Um, I'm curious because you mentioned you only have 250 data points. That's relatively little for any meaningful analysis of data of any sort. So, what kind of things would you wish you had? What kind of resource or data or, or information you wish that you, you would have at that point in time that would help you in your work or with accuracy and so on and Ah, so, uh, so, by, so we started on Saturday morning, and by Saturday afternoon we had this plot, right? But this is this was not um, uh, this didn't prove you know with, without with um, absolute certainty that it was uh, it was one training causing the issue. So at this point we were only sure that 
about 73 percent uh, of uh, of the incidents were caused by a road train, and it was only by when we had the train positions for the entire uh, for the entire month of August and uh, and November that we were con that we could. Uh, convincingly argue that PV46 caused 95% of the incidents. So uh, the data that we, we, I guess we needed most was uh, the location of the, the locations of the trains uh, over the entire day, entire month, entire period, period of the incidents. I would turn the question around. I mean, what why do you say it's not free data and why do you say that we need more data? Um, I would like to argue we didn't need any more data because the key is we managed to identify the cause of the trade. DSA was able to identify it as part of it all and we saw the problem ahead because we saw the problems. So for the purposes of this use case, um, it was not a good one. And one of the other points that people obsess about is is it free data? Is it small data? Did I use my food cluster? Did I use machine learning? Like what fancy man? Did I use like, is that really relevant for the, for the case point? Uh, if you're building a, a system with real time streaming information, then obviously this is good. But I think the point that we learned uh, most from this is, is really that in the end of the day, the science of the data is going to be relevant to the problem of the attack. They needed, the team was activated on a Sunday morning um, uh, because I suppose they wanted to because what else the data scientists have to do on a Sunday morning? <laughs> <laughs> I think the best advice I can find 
across the feedback when approaching the problem uh, is again to plot as many dimensions as possible as you can a single plot and then use your eyes to look to the page. Uh, in this case, now we have two spatial information and time information, so it's okay to look at. Let's say you have other information like uh, uh, higher dimensional data. You can go for a 3D plot over that. Or it's possible to do 4D, but you know, there are limitations to that. So uh, again, uh, scatter plots are the best tools for best tools for this. Um, and uh, yeah, that, and after that, we plot it. And so we draw intuition. And you put yourself in the best position by doing five additional points. Going back to the 250 data points, how, how do you come to that set of data? Did someone from SMR data actually pass your that small amount of data or did you all make some suggestions to them? Uh, yes. Uh, so, again, uh, like we said, like I said earlier, we started with a hunch. So and so at that time, as a, at, uh, SMRT provided us the data, we requested the data, and SMRT provided us the data, and and that was the most easily accessible data. Because if I'm not wrong, that this data set is um, how can you describe it? It's not um, from an automated sensor system. This was actually keyed by hand. So that was the most accessible data. If you if they wanted. Uh, more detailed data, they would have to go into the, their system. I don't know how long it would take to churn out uh, the CSV and just to extract the data. I, uh, so I, I was not super clear with respect to the um, visualization you had when you had someone who actually stared at the monitor for under three every morning. What exactly was he doing? Ah, okay. So. Uh, <laughs> Okay, that's so uh, we were told that we were going to, that Terence was going to take a look at the videos and we thought it would be CCTV videos. No. So um, uh, how do I describe this? Can I uh. <laughs> <laughs>
I, I think maybe the takeaway from here is that um, some some data early is better uh, because we only got this data I think, on, on late late Sunday or Monday. Uh, Sunday afternoon. Yeah, Sunday afternoon. But we needed to make a decision by by Saturday afternoon. So oh sorry, it's Saturday. Sunday, Sunday morning. Sunday morning. Sunday morning. So uh, the video was the best shot we had. And, uh, yeah, about working with it, we didn't have. To. Yeah, so you, you you can see here that uh, that in the absence of clear cut compute data from the computer, you 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 have multiple candidates, right? Forty three is a candidate, forty six is a candidate, sixteen, forty six. What's that one? Uh, that was all filtered by hand, and then the ones that appeared most frequently with the occurrence of incidents was forty six. Yeah. Okay, uh, I, uh, my question is not much of a methodology, but rather the implications of this incident. So, uh, what do you think that how, how much can this incident affect the confidence of all the other organizations on the on the in general? Okay, so this is this is Sorry, so just last question, last question. Yeah. So it's actually like it, it seems like uh, basically actually the way do you do you foresee yourself being activated more often in the future? <laughs> Uh, we have shared like our practices with SMRT. We had uh, free lunches with them, for example. Uh, pretty good ones. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have shared we have shared the the methodology, and so SMRT, for example, is also looking into how they can uh, develop their data science teams. I think uh, what's good what's what's good is if um, the different Departments share their strengths across government uh, between the public and private sector. And only next to It's easy, 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 right? Last um, uh, question. There is a lot of interest in uh, in data science. Uh, the yeah. is it? Um, but even the government context is just part of the security agency. There are many different. Uh, Used to be uh, business analytics or MS teams or different artists in government who have data and questions. So there, there are many things in the US. Uh, what we try to do is begin to try and run a lot more courses. We are running a course with the civil service college, the three day kind of introduction to basic Pablo R method for civil servants. Uh, we also help to um, uh, grow how the agencies go there for the So I think there's a lot of interest. I think the useful thing about this exercise is also to explain to people you don't need to start with machine learning or AI or whatever. It's really to make sure you have a bunch of people being curious about the data, looking at visualizations. When I'm not saying about tools, whether it's Tableau, R, or Python, or Bigview, or uh, uh, Excel, um, but I think in this particular case, I encourage them to this, this is something to start with. Um, so I think that's the message that, that we have from this. Uh, and I think there's a lot of interest. Thank you for the team uh, for the wonderful sharing. Let's give them a round of applause.